uh, Rosemary, who can who can join us directly, and who will talk about us about Confessions of a Perk Geek, my first API. Hello, Rosemary. How are you? I'm good. Uh, how are you? I'm I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Like a lot of people are talking about APIs, and so yeah, we're really glad to have you. Uh, so you're based in Asia Asia Pacific in Australia, right? Yes, I am in uh, Melbourne. Melbourne. So yeah, it's really an international conference. Uh, this is only because of online capabilities. So let's uh, uh, be happy with it. And I will let you uh, the floor and the stage. So if thank you, you so much. And tell your geek story. So hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Um, I'm Rosemary. And um, as Mary mentioned, I'm, I'm based here in um, Melbourne. Um, I work in the product space for Xero. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard about Xero, we are a cloud accounting software company headquartered in New Zealand. Um, and I work obviously here from um, in AU, uh, looking after various different um, global initiatives. And uh, my connection with um, APIs is, I do very, uh, work very closely with um, an ecosystem of app partners. We've, uh, we've got like a huge suite of uh, products and I do look at integrations for a particular product. And today, uh, my topic is actually going to touch on uh, the experiences that I've had uh, working as a software engineer myself, uh, going back to my days where I wrote web services, REST APIs. And um, I've learned a lot through my own mistakes and um, a lot of learnings from my peers as well. Um, and so here I am here today to share some myths and anti-patterns that I have uh, uh, observed, okay? So let me start. Um, some background about myself. Um, I do have a strong engineering background, uh, primarily in Java, and then um, moved into mobile technologies, and then ended up doing some research while I also worked. Um, and moved into a startup arena where I got to get my hands dirty and touch on different disciplines, design being one. And eventually, here I am in the product uh, space. Now, to give you um, a bit of a background on what I'm going to talk about and my history. So I've uh, touched on engineering, design, and product. And most recently, my work has been in the tech PM space. And I've observed that there are um, a lot of myths and anti-patterns. And the most forgotten bit is the product mindset in the field of APIs. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, talking about the product aspect, the process aspect, and the design aspect, mainly from the different experiences that I've had working for customers in India, US, and now um, Australia. So rather than talking about a full-fledged API product, I'm going to talk about some of the um, experiences have, I've had uh, before we started that API journey itself. So starting from your first endpoint, your first API, right? Without further delay, I will jump in. The first anti-pattern that's going to touch on the product space. Now, APIs are an afterthought. Now, um, to talk about it, um, most companies are have a traditional business model, right? Uh, we've never thought about APIs, and that's how I started my uh, um, career as well. You are busy fulfilling business needs, driving, you know, um, looking at different capabilities, and API wasn't in the picture at all. It's only after you start, uh, uh, you know, rethinking your whole strategy, you start building uh, different applications, you might want to start thinking, how is it that you're going to interact, say, internally with other development teams? You might be wanting to build a new application where you might want to expose some of your data internally. And that's where internal APIs would come in. Or you might already have an established relationship uh, with a particular partner, and you might want to work along with them. And that's where you get the partner APIs, which is like a hybrid between internal and um, public um, APIs. And this is very different. This model is very different to API-focused companies, the trending companies right now, like Twilio and Stripe, where they create and sell APIs, right? So their their main source of revenue comes from APIs. But this thinking is changing now, even with the traditional um, companies, which are now moving towards that API-enabled strategy. So to give you an um, uh, example, like I worked on a, a monolithic, uh, application. So it is a massive uh, product. Um, the core offering was also 
had some add-ons. Uh, each of them were their own products and they were very tightly coupled. And the core offering was also, um, we did expose some of the functionality as an API. And I looked after one of the offshoots. Um, what happened is there were use cases that were pop cropping up and we did have to actually find a solution to various different use cases. So we started adding to the mess of this uh, monolithic application by adding in more endpoints to an existing API. Now, that was not the way to go because when you start moving from legacy monolithic to microservices or anything else, you are adding to this mess when you are having tightly coupled products. So that's what we had to rethink and then come up with another strategy to say, okay, part, problem one, you've got to decouple these products. Problem two, do not add to the complexity by adding additional endpoints in an existing API. It's got to be a product by itself, right? So that's exactly what I'm trying to say. It's most often that um, these type of class companies, APIs end up being an afterthought or as a part of the development process. But you've got to also think that you've got a lot of data right? You might want to monetize um, on the data at a later stage. You, know, you might want to be picky and choosy as to what, can I tap into this data potential? Would this data have external value? Those are aspects that you would need to start looking at before you jump into just solving a particular problem. And the key takeaway here is You've got to understand that you're moving in that direction of APIs and you've always got to uh, keep that in mind and uh, be driven uh, from a strategic point of view as well. Moving on to the next one. So that's uh, continuing from the previous uh, anti pattern. Now, most often when I've been working with my own uh, uh, dev teams as well, um, APIs come across as very technical solutions. Uh, why so? Because we end up working with developers um, and hence they're not products. Now that isn't right because um, it's, you might like to take on the previous example where um, I did mention that we started looking at a particular use case that ended up being a solution to a particular problem. So it's very tightly coupled to one problem, one initiative, what does that mean in the long term? You are building a, um, into an API or building a new API just for one person in mind, and that's incorrect. To give you an example, we went into um, uh, an agreement with a particular developer who had uh, their base in AU and various other um, uh, regions as well. And one of the companies that I worked for was actually uh, looking to step into an emerging market. And that was the prime reason for us to enter into uh, a deal with this particular developer. That was the long-term vision. But what happened is um, in AU, we started working very closely with this developer, trying to end up uh, solving different use cases only for that particular driver, more, more like a partner type of an API. But where, what, where we ended eventually over a period of time is neither was that um, API used in AU, and eventually we were not able to have a, a firm footing in the new markets as well, because this particular developer had uh, their user base shrinking. So these type of APIs were shuttered for low adoption, which means it is kind of throwaway which is exactly the reason why we've got to think before we start our writing our first API that do not look at it as a technical solution. Also look at it that it might open up various different uh, partnerships, right? You might have a new business channel at all. It might bring you different leads. It might bring you um, a change in your revenue model, right? And compared to the previous traditional way of uh, uh, running businesses with the user in mind, you've got to start looking at um, developer-driven business needs. And so the product mindset has to come in um, and the technical mindset has to take a backseat. So what does that mean? Do we exclude developers? Do we exclude product people? No. Developers got to be um, got to wear the product hat as well. And product people who do not have a technical background got to be technical as well to a certain extent. So ensure that you got people from different disciplines before you take a call as to whether um, APIs are a solution for you or whether you need to start changing that mindset. 
Now, okay, talking on process, uh, agile, agile, agile has been always um, the way that we work most recently with different flavors. And um, I've noticed that most often we do have um, the, in the field of APIs, you know, especially when you're writing a first one, you want to like spec it out completely, uh, go through, you know, feasibility, uh, check on your end, and then, you know, do the development testing phase and then the feedback phase, right? The typical water flow. We do not have to do that, right? You've got to keep in mind that um, innovation demands agility and that comes to collective ownership. API um, development can also be agile. And what do I mean by this? Because um, you may want to change your process, the way you do it. So to give you um, an example, um, let's say you're working with um, on internal APIs, right? Um, so your, when I say internal APIs, your own company, you might be wanting to build an API, internal API just for other development teams. Now, how can you be agile in that context? Do not invest too much in a process, um, but have something more lightweight. Uh, build your own, uh, build a POC, write your own client, maybe test it out, or try and get um, the internal consumer to actually start using those APIs, right? But do it differently. Don't have documentation. See them write your their own client, observe whether it's clear to them. That's a way where you can get feedback without actually teaching them and having documentation. But this is going to work well only for internal. And eventually you'll change that model. But when it comes to public APIs, partner APIs, your approach is going to be different. You've got to have that collaborative way of thinking. You've got to ensure that you spec it all out together. You have that contract, but get it out early, right? Things like Open API helps you to actually have that spec out early, the contract established early. Think about what protocols, design that together, ensure you're talking about different environments that you want to have, simulated environments that you will want to uh, test it out. Do that so that you bring that same agile process um, into when you're talking about APIs as well. And so what is key here is keep in mind that you've got to have that API first approach and look at options that, you, that would work best for you. Okay, this is, this is quite interesting because uh, the previous topic was also about um, automation. So I'm going to touch touch on a, a little bit here. So what exactly is the problem here? Now, most companies are trying to leverage off artificial intelligence, so machine learning and NLP and everything else. Um, but how does that fit into APIs? They, most often we think that they're not complementary. They don't go hand in hand. But where can we use them? So let me give you an example, especially in the, of the field that I work in for compliance. Um, You've got to be choosy about which dev partners you uh, enter into an agreement with for various uh, compliance reasons. So you do have a security assessment, you've got like certification requirements which come in from different regulated bodies. So what happens is when you initially, when you're signing off with them and you have this integration going, you go through this process, all good, you know how many calls they have, are they going to make, what their use cases are. But what happens a year later? You have absolutely no clue at all because you might see um, a change in their usage pattern, right? Um, and you do not know whether, um, is that legitimate? Is, isn't that? Is that not legitimate? So what happens is sometimes, and this is, this is a new area for us too, so you get like sales and marketing and dev evangelists actually trying to work together and try and understand um, and start profiling uh, different apps and their categories and to see what has changed over last, the last year. And then we decide as to whether we need to do reassess them again. But this can be automated, right? You might want to start monitoring this, start profiling the APIs in based on the different app categories. And then this will help you understand and uh, do some pattern recognition. And that's where ML can help. So I've just given an example of unsupervised learning where you can try and understand the different clusters, which will help you to understand the patterns, right? So that's one example where you can look at um, usage profiling. The next one though is um, security testing. We've got this traditional mindset of using the basic tools um, for our security testing, 
Um, so it can be like uh, you ensure you're safe from DDoS attacks, CDNs, WAFs, OVAS for principles, uh, session management, using gateways to ensure you have like valid inputs. All that's fine. But what happens on a per API basis? So going back to what do I mean by per API basis? So each API is going to have its own pattern, its own usage, right? And hackers could always come and um, there are different loopholes to actually hack those APIs based on their usage patterns, based on you know who calls them in, different, different loopholes. Now that could go unnoticed or missed out in a traditional security uh, testing techniques using those traditional testing techniques. But that's where AI comes in. So now you, you do have, you can leverage your tools where you will actually be able to um, say, understand the traffic, uh, understand what the good traffic is, understand what the bad traffic is, try and predict, okay, try and figure out if, if they're anomalous activity, right? And then maybe you could uh, uh, block the traffic. You keep constantly learning, right? Tools like being intelligence, all that would help you, right? Decoy APIs can be implemented so that you understand what, what is happening. Keep tabs on what is, what is being blocked. All these uh, examples um, where you can leverage off the capabilities that you can get from AI, right? So you've got to keep in mind that you might want to have these in both. You might want to use uh, tools from um, uh, external providers. It all comes down to what is the best solution for you. So keep in mind that AI is still applicable in this context. Okay. Most often we say users um, in a business context, but not in the world of APIs. Um, and that's that's a really bad uh, way of thinking. You've got to remember that your developers are your users. And But how do we ensure that we have this user-centric or this developer empathy? Whether it be um, you want to invest in design or not, your approach can change. So as I mentioned, you want to build a POC, you want to build your own client, Test it out internally, right? Get that feedback and engage constantly with your developers so that you know that uh, you are across everything as well, as well as they would be able to ensure that their process of working and API development goes smoothly too, right? But it's different. It's going to be a different set of uh, tools and uh, the communication is also going to be um, Key. As we heard in one of the talks, it's just not coding, it's also the communication. So that's key when you're also talking to your um, external uh, windows, your external developers too. So you want to collaboratively work with them, you want to prototype together, you want to get them involved. Do not alienate them. They are also your users and do have developer empathy, which is not spoken much at all. We talk a lot about human-centric design, but we don't do not apply that to developers, okay? Once you've got to the stage where it's not, um, it's large scale and you're opened up and it's public APIs, then your approach is going to change. You are going to look at, um, you know, forums, you're going to look at a um, visual, lot of visual aids, portals, explorers, and that's, that's a totally different. And API uh, management itself will be a solution by itself. Okay, so have that thinking, whether it's small scale or large scale. Um, often, this is a mindset that we have. We think APIs are REST and they are CRUD, right? But that's it's. We are going beyond uh, CRUD at, uh, in the stage. It's not just REST now. We have async APIs. Even when we're talking about REST, we have webhooks. We are talking about uh, you know even driven architecture, which means um, it's pub and sub. And um, maybe when you're talking about performance, you're thinking of protobuf and gRPC. Right, or when you're talking about getting a subset of fields with multiple resources, you're talking about GraphQL. Now, most of us would be familiar with this, but the reason I stress this is I've noticed that with most um, developers who are entering uh, the field of APIs for the first time with the junior developers, the mindset is only CRUD. We've got to get out of that mindset because we thought REST will replace SOAP, which it hasn't. And now what's happening is we think REST is all about CRUD. There's an anti-sentiment about REST as well, which is, is GraphQL going to replace it? Is uh, gRPC going to replace it? We, we, it's not that. Each one has their own use cases. But it's key for us as 
technical people as developers uh, starting out in the field of APIs to think big and think of all possible op options that we have. Least if we think well, we'll be looking at gRPC and GraphQL a few years back in time, it was totally web services and SOAP and everything else. So do not have a fixed mindset try and look at various other options, which whether it be performance, whether it be low couple, uh, low, loose coupling like HitOS, or whether you're working with gadgets like Fitbit, and you're talking about devices, think, think broad. And this applies, especially when you are looking at the strategic and the product side of your offerings as well. Black boxes. Um, you probably would guess what this is. We talk about logging, monitoring, but something that we often miss, miss out is it's not about using monitoring tools, alerts, um, and you know having the basic health checks. It's not that. You've got to ensure that you, you have the right uh, metrics. You've got to ensure that you are logging the right data. So for instance, uh, I've noticed that even in my teams, we always have 5XX in the part with our junior teams starting out. Why? Because we just want to get work done. We don't uh, get to, you know, writing proper response codes. The next point is please take care of um, PII as well. You do not want to have sensitive data and end up having a project at a later stage where you are going to redact all that information, right? Think of all that. And also it's very key for us to log correctly and especially in the field of uh, Compliance to auditing is very key for us. And your retries sometimes, it's not like just using um, exponential back of algorithms where you just reduce frequency. Sometimes regulatory bodies could actually tell you um, to retry at a particular interval, or you've got to have all that type of auditing um, information too. Okay, and so be very transparent because sometimes your data leaks, your security breaches could happen without anyone being aware of this. And the primary reason could be maybe you've just not coded it well, you've just not taken the right steps, right? So you might want to look out for various different uh, problems that could exist. So you might notice uh, your content size being actually massive, where it should be 15 KB, it's 100 KB. So look out for different, different things when you're monitoring, not the standard set of, um, say, uh, metrics. Right? Look out, be, be, uh, be a little bit more open. And ultimately, um, when it comes to the documentation, we know that there's no U, new UI. Um, you may not have even a full-fledged visual aid or you know, develop a document when you're starting out, but ensure that you have something, have a post, simple Postman collection, have, um, or you want to build something simple, a simple uh, UI, do that. Okay, ensure that there is a, whether it be a sophisticated tool or whether it be a simple tool, ensure that uh, everything is clearly stated. And my last one, um, often uh, we say APIs cannot be hacked because we have OAuth and TLS. Um, that's not the case um, because you, if you're familiar with the OSI model, you've got so many different layers. You can look at security from pretty much every layer. So you can look at the session layer, session management. You can look at what goes wrong with your tokens. You can look at what goes wrong with your physical layer. You can look at what goes wrong with uh, your data. Do you need encryption? So look at security at every at every layer. And something which is key most often, and if you look at Gartner's report, you'll you'll notice that most often the security team, if you have one, wouldn't get involved until the very last stage of the of API development, and that is completely incorrect. Get a security audit done as early as possible. Or just get involved with the security team, and if you do not have one, please wear the security hat, okay? That's on the development side. But on the management side, ensure that you are working with the right development partners. Ensure that they are credible. Ensure that you're aware of their brand, right? And whether they can sustain that over time. Do a security check-in, not at when you sign off, but do a constant. Think of reassessing um, your integration with them. And ultimately, trust no one. That it's Take it in the right sense. You've got to ensure that your mutual uh, users have the best experience. You have that constant uh, happy engagement with your developers. So the trust no one thinking will help you ensure that everything is working perfectly. And I'd like to end this on a very light note. Yeah, so if you got that, 
it says you've got an API, you've got an API, we've all got APIs. And that's exactly where we are heading uh, in the next over the next few years. Thank, thank you, you very much, Rosemary. Uh, thank you for all this complete uh, uh, overview about you know thinking APIs in terms of products. Uh, we we actually spent all the time for the presentation, but we didn't want to cut. It was really uh, insightful. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, and again, we'll be glad to have you for, at other conferences to tell the story. Right. Thank you very much, Rosemary. And, thank you. Uh,